so another uh, habit you talk about, which is which is really fascinating, is about the habit of being clueless. And I know some people are masters at being clueless, but but what do you mean by that from a sort of a beneficial perspective of being in, a, in an organisation? What I mean by that, yet again going back to the entrepreneur's analogy, yeah. is when I started Coffee Republic, my first business, um, I was clueless. I was clueless about coffee, clueless about retail, clueless about catering. So both Bobby and I were clueless about this business we're going to go into. Yeah. And you would sort of think that was a disadvantage. But I actually learned later on that that was a big advantage that we were clueless. Because in a way, our mind was uncontaminated by mm. this is how they've always done it was contaminated by someone tried it, it didn't work. So all we had was this vision of this coffee bar in front of our eyes without any obstacles. You know, we were blissfully, naively ignorant of all the obstacles. So we just went and made it happen. Yeah. But the problem with people who already were in these bigger coffee companies was, you know, they could see a million and one reasons why it wouldn't work. They probably suggested to someone, someone said, someone tried it, it doesn't work. Someone said, this is not how we do things. Yeah. What we do works, why change it? And so that's exactly the same analogy in people working in larger companies. Because to an extent, their success, their experience becomes a straitjacket. Mm. So every time they want to do something new, there's always the, this is how we've always done a mentality, yeah. which stops you ever doing anything new. Yeah. So you get restricted, you get constrained mm. by... This is how we do it around right. here. This is how things are done. Yeah. So you never, you know, that just keeps you there. It sort of imprisons you. Yeah. And you never find a new way of doing things. If Rose in the accounts department did something in 1974, it didn't work, it then goes into the corporate manual, it becomes the Bible for the Absolutely. psyche of the organisation. So really challenge, look at the, uh, the beliefs around you and challenge those beliefs. Exactly, exactly. I mean, there's this great um, saying from Henry Ford, the car maker, Apparently, he was trying to make the conveyor belt go faster. Yeah. And the guys on the conveyor belt said to him, sorry, Mr. Ford, we've been on this conveyor belt for 30, 40 years. And believe it, believe us, you know, we've tried it. This conveyor belt cannot go any faster. And his reaction, Henry Ford's reaction was, OK, then go and find me some 19-year-old <laughs> who's got no idea this can't go any faster. Yeah. Because the 19-year-old could then make it happen. And, and that is exactly that, that scenario, I think. Mm. is that you just need to use, you, and if you can't, you're not going to sort of fire yourself. You just have to forget about what you know yeah. and just make sure that you're wiping the slate clean. Mm. And, you know, you're not supposed to know what you find, so you come across new things. Yeah. Just having an open mind. Yeah. It's exactly what Tom Peters, because we interviewed Tom Peters, and it's exactly what he was saying. You know, hire those obnoxious people that are going to be aggressive and tell you that you're wrong in everything that you do because you want to hire those people to challenge all your beliefs internally. Exactly, but, exactly. But a lot of hiring managers, I think, think, I'm not hiring that person because it would be a nightmare to manage. <laughs> Whereas it sort of goes against the, as you said, you've got to get those people in the organisation to challenge the beliefs. If you can't, then you'll hire somebody Exactly. And I mean, just, you know, you sort of people hire people who fit in. And yeah. when you fit in, you obviously have all, you know, and what's it, it, interesting for me coming from the outside is, um, you know, as we got bigger in both businesses I started, you then hire people who've actually almost had the same CV, have sort of been That's in right. equivalent companies. Mm. Um, and so they've all had the same experience. Yeah. And so no one's got that outside perspective. Yeah. And for me, the only outside perspective to have is from the inside out, the customer's perspective. Mm. So everyone's sort of stuck reading the same reports, reading, reading the same sort of conventional practices. And so no one ever comes across new ways of doing things. And it's interesting, I just was doing the research in my book, I realized some Nobel Prize winners, they actually kind of stop their students, they actually tell them off if they're reading kind of industry practice, because that's, that's no way are they going to invent anything new. And just by forgetting about all that is how they're going to stumble across new things. So hi, you talk about the success trap as well. So what's the success trap? Success trap is something um, we all have. You know, I think, um, I think as Bill Gates said, uh, sort of failure makes heroes, but success makes monsters. <laughs> um, the success trap is somewhere we all go to where things work. And, you know, if it ain't broke, why fix it? Mm. It's a sort of success trap. So why on earth change the status quo when it's working perfectly? Right. But the danger of that is if you don't, then it makes you complacent. Yeah. And I find in life we all go through these periods where we have a real productivity, we're seeking, you know, starting from nothing, we make it there and then we plateau because you're successful and then you get complacent and yeah. then you realise the complacency is not going to work for you. So you kind of give it another big burst of energy. Yeah. And so that's what the success trap is. It's just almost 
thinking you're in some sort of a comfort zone, that you're in a good place and not realizing actually um, it's a bit sort of who moved my cheese slightly, the success trap. Yeah, it? yeah. Because I suppose the more successful you are, the more defensive. You sort of hold on to that with a kung fu grip and that success and you become defensive as opposed to offensive. Um, exactly, yeah. You, you, can just get, you don't need to strive that hard anymore. You lose mm. that hunger. Mm. Um, you get heavy. And I found that very much in my, my own life. Um, and I think success is a very bad teacher in, in a way. And yeah. you just always want to keep that agility and looking around and innovating and risking. Yeah. And you know, great companies that constantly do that and put their neck out, although they don't need to technically, are the ones mm. that, that stay alive, basically. Yeah. Simon Calver from the CEO of Love Film we interviewed, he was saying that you know, he's number one, obviously, in, in his industry space, but he's always wanting to look at how to cannibalize himself, because if he's not, yes, then his competitors yes. will be. Absolutely, absolutely. So never being complacent, always pushing for the next product that you, as you say, innovating on behalf of your customer, coming up with the next product for them. Exactly, because I mean, obviously, and especially in this world, it's such a cliche, but what works for you now is not going to work for you tomorrow. And it's just so easy to assume that what works for you now will just continue working for you every day. And I wish it was so, but it's not. So, <laughs> yeah, so I think kind of my point is if you're switched on, you're constantly um, thinking ahead.